Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think Bill said it pretty well, but I'll say it again. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. We're very glad to have our moms. Now, something every mother, I think, will understand very well is the reality that kids like to push boundaries, don't they? A child actually strives to explore the edge of just how far they can go before they get in real trouble, right? I was in Reno with a friend and his kids this uh, last week, and I was checking out at the hardware store when his son sort of left him and came and stood by me, and I looked at him and said, hey, little man, you might want to go hang out with your dad. He looks at me square in the eyes, no. <laughs> and then the cashier turns around, hears it, and he looks at me like, ooh, someone's in trouble. But he wasn't talking about the kid. I was the one in trouble, right? I was the one who had something on my hands. Bill, your mic's on, you might want to mute it. Just heads up. Um, <laughs> I feel really good because all the did, laughter's so loud. Just just the mic up. <laughs> um, so we actually have some friends from Idaho who came and visited a couple of weeks ago, and they brought their three-year-old son, Benjamin, and Benjamin's a typical boy. He doesn't have a whole lot to say, but he knows the words that he likes. And every time we drive down the road and we see a tractor or a truck, he's like, big truck, right? He's that kind of kid. Well, he's at that age where he's starting to test the boundaries of just how many times he can ignore his mother before he gets in real trouble. Benny, take a bite, please. No response. Y'all know what this is like. Benjamin, take a bite, please. Now they're doing like gymnastics in their chair at the dinner table or getting on their knees. Yeah. Benjamin Landon Gardner, you take a bite or so, help me. And we all know that when mama uses your middle name, you are at the edge of existence. And if you go any further, you don't know if you're going to come back alive, right? We know that that's how this works. <clears throat> Children like to push the boundaries. They like to explore the boundaries between right and wrong. We've been working through uh, the book of 1 Peter here at Oasis Community Church for a while now, and we're right in the middle, immersed in this discussion about uh, Christian suffering. There are times all across the world where people face slander or persecution because of their association with Jesus. And last week, we dealt with this reality that... We live in an in-between time, right, where the promises of God and Jesus are real to us today. We experience them every day in our lives, in our hearts, yet there are some promises of God that have not been realized yet in the world, right? Jesus said he's going to return, but that hasn't happened yet. And it might leave some of us asking, why? What in the world is taking you so long? And last week, Peter sort of addressed that, right? He um, referenced the life of Noah to make the point that God is patient enough to allow time for every person who will find and follow Jesus to actually come to faith in Jesus. And in that in-between time, when God is being patient with the world, right, we will inevitably face suffering, just like Noah did when he's building the ark. Well, Today, Peter wants to address a real-life issue here in regards to slander, because sometimes when we come to faith in Jesus, our friends don't like it very much. And they may put pressures on us to do things that all of a sudden we may not feel comfortable doing anymore, right? And they may actually, actually slander us. Oh, you goody two-shoes. You Jesus freak, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with this. And we have to be able to deal with that. And the reality is it may push us to a place where we actually begin to test the boundaries of just how far we can go before we get into real trouble. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's open them up to 1 Peter chapter 4. Today we're looking at verses 1 through 6. And I'll have these up on the screen for you as well. He says... Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with this same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. 
You didn't think the word orgies was in the Bible, but there it is. <laughs> With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And they malign you for it. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way that God does. Now, when I came to faith in Jesus, some of you guys might relate to this, I had some friends who weren't too happy about it. And they tried to pressure me to do things that all of a sudden I wasn't all that comfortable doing, right? And let's be real, I was a surprise to them. They had one friend one day, and then I gave my life to Jesus, and my life began to change. And they were confused by that. They were perhaps even hurt by that. And they wanted me to uh, use language that they used, to watch movies that they wanted to watch, and perhaps buy magazines that they wanted to look at. But I didn't feel this was right anymore. And something interesting happened. As my life began to change, they began to feel like I was condemning them simply because I wouldn't participate in some of the things that they wanted to participate in. I didn't say anything about those things. It's not like I was calling them wicked or, or cruel or evil. I just simply didn't want to go to certain parties that they wanted to go to or read certain things or watch certain things that they wanted to watch. And they felt that that was a condemnation of their lifestyle. You may have experienced this. And I think Peter has something similar in mind when he writes this passage. What does he say? For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. In other words, the time that you had when that you didn't know Jesus was plenty for going out and participating in all this stuff. Now that you know Jesus, why would you go back to it? And then he continues... That with respect to these things, they, the Gentiles or the unbelievers, are surprised. It's a surprise to them when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you for it. So not only is Peter saying, might we face slander or name calling or persecution because we're associating ourselves with Jesus. That's one reality. Because we um, tell people Jesus said he's coming back, but he isn't here yet. And that puts us in that awkward position. We talked about that last week. We will face slander for that, but we might actually face it also because we want to pursue things that are perhaps good for our lives or abstain from things that aren't. They might actually persecute us for that as well. Now, nobody likes being slandered or maligned by people they call friends, do we? I certainly don't. The people that I hung out with at school and then I gave my life to Jesus and now all of a sudden they're not so nice to me, I didn't enjoy that at all. And I also didn't want them to feel like I was condemning them at all. I didn't want that. I cared about these people. But I also knew that Jesus wanted certain things for my life and I cared about him and it put me in this awkward, difficult social environment. Coming to faith in Jesus does not make social pressures any easier, right? And so let me tell you what I tried to do, because I don't think it worked very well. I began to try to split hairs between what parts of their activities were technically wrong and what parts weren't. And there's a question that I uh, get asked pretty often by people who feel like they're in this position. Like they don't know how to uh, function and work with their friends who don't believe in Jesus. And the question is, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Just how far can I go with my girlfriend physically before it's too far? Just how many drinks can I have before I'm technically getting drunk? Just how much can I flirt with my coworker without technically cheating on my husband? We begin to split hairs. We begin to ask questions. We ask, is this a sin? Is that a sin? And part of what I think we're here to talk about today is a huge problem with this question. Because when we ask that, what we're really asking is, how far can I go 
before I get in real trouble. And guys, that is simply legalism. That is following a system of laws, not a loving and personal God. When you walk the line between sin and not sin, that is simply legalism. You see, <clears throat> we have to ask the question, would God want to communicate to us, a loving God want to relate to us on a basis of what is minimally important for you to do to live a good life? You think that's what he wants? Because I don't think it is. <clears throat> when we pursue, when we strive to find the edge of what is wrong, we're following, we're worshiping a set of laws. Some of you have pointed out to me that there's actually a boundary that I can get pretty dangerously close to crossing when I speak on Sunday mornings, and it's the edge of the stage. Right? Some of you, especially those who sit up front, you know, you can see the edge. You know I like to move around. I like to get to the edge of the room. I like to make sure that uh, people on the outsides aren't falling asleep too much. I like to look people in the eyes when we're talking about the scriptures, right? And I need to move to do that. But some of you who sit up close know that every time I get really close to the edge, you cringe a little bit. And you cringe because you're afraid that one day I might just <laughs> come off the edge. Right? <clears throat> what I can promise you, and you may not be doing this in your mind, you might not actually be thinking this, but your actions speak for themselves. And if you are living your life in such a way that you are pushing the boundaries, that you're seeing just how far you can go before you fall off, the only way you're going to answer that question is by falling off. You see this? If this is your boundary, <coughs> especially those of us that didn't grow up in church, we're going to face the reality that our relationships end up changing, right? Because other people are playing with this edge and we don't want to fall off. So we begin to back away. This is a reality. Now, is that because we've been given some sort of new uh, system of rules to follow that no one else has been given and our basic function is to keep them? No. Listen, if something is wrong for you who know Jesus to do, it's just as wrong for someone who does not know Jesus to do, right? It's not like we have a different set of standards here. And Peter makes this point pretty clear. Look at what he says. Uh, actually, I don't have that one on the screen. Um, where are we? He says, But they will give an account to him, God, who judges the living and the dead. See, he's going to hold everybody accountable to the lives that they've lived, right? The difference is, in Christ, we have the righteousness of Jesus to cover over all of the ways that we fall off this edge, right? This is the difference. So how do we honor that? Is there perhaps a less legalistic, less rules-based approach? Is there perhaps a more relational approach to our moral lives with God? And I think there is. You see, a child strives to pursue the boundaries of what's right and wrong, but an adult, a mature Christian person, Instead, tries, strives to bring pleasure to the people that they love, especially God. And there's two different angles here. The legalistic approach has a very negative angle, right? Well, I can go this far, but if I go this much further, then I'm in trouble. And the other says, why would I even want to get close to the edge? Because my purpose, my goal, is not to follow some set of rules, but to actually bring pleasure to people that I love. Look again at what Peter says at the beginning of this passage. Since therefore Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with this same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. In other words, if you have claimed the name of Christ, and if therefore you've also claimed the reality that you will be slandered because of the name of Christ, right? if you've gladly taken this life upon yourself, 
then why would you even consider walking close to the edge? Why would you care about where the boundary is because you have no intention to approach it? This is what he's saying. And he says, because you have ceased from sin, therefore you live the rest of your time in the flesh or the rest of your life no longer for human passions but for the will of God. We've talked a lot about the will of God in this section of his letter, haven't we? Three weeks ago we uh, described the different ways we use that term. Well, here's what I think is probably one of the most uh, largest problems with modern day American Christianity. And it is that when we discuss the will of God, we're far too preoccupied with what God feels about our circumstances, right? Who does God want me to marry? What career does God want me to have? How many children is God uh, going to give me? And we preoccupy ourselves with the who, what, when, where, and how we're going to live, work, love. But what if? What if 95% of pursuing God's will for your life was not about the circumstances themselves or the specifics of the circumstances, but what kind of person you are being in the midst of those circumstances? I cannot tell you how many times I hear people ask me, well, what if I just married the wrong person? Well, that's a legalistic question. The better question is, can you be the right person to bring pleasure to your spouse and to your God? We can't miss the connection here <clears throat> that Peter makes with Christian suffering. He's saying here that even in the midst of trial and slander, we can ju be just as much in the will of God in suffering as we can be in peace. This week, there was a pastor and seven people in his congregation who were murdered in Burkina Faso because they refused to uh, convert to Islam. <laughs> and what Peter's saying here is, even when a gun is pointed at your head, even in circumstances that God hates, that he does not want to be the case, you can be just as much in the will of God for your life in that moment as you can in perfect peace. Why? Because 95% of what God desires for you is less about the circumstances of your life, but more about who you are being despite the circumstances of your life. Now, as your pastor, um, there's a difficult job I have to do sometimes. We have to have some really real conversations, right? And please, when I say these things, I'm not talking down at you at all. I am just a man trying to bring pleasure to my God like any of you are. But some of you are bringing a whole lot of damage into your marriages because you are pushing the boundaries of just how far you can go before you get in trouble. Just how many times can I flirt with that guy at work before someone takes it too far? Just how many times can I look at pornographic videos or images before someone finds out? And I don't think you want to find the answer to that question, either of them, do you? I know I don't want you to find the answer to that question. High schoolers, just how many times you have to use that vape pen before it just gets old and boring. And what are you going to do when that happens? Are you going to try and find some further edge to pursue some other drug or product? How many times can you put yourself in a situation with your boyfriend or your girlfriend where you're alone and things start to turn horizontal before someone takes something too far? It's not about how strong you are to resist temptation. It's about whether or not you actually want to put yourself in that position to begin with. The last thing that I want to see is anybody fall off the edge in this regard, right? We're not following a basic set of rules. We're following a God who cares about and loves us. And our desire is to bring pleasure to the people that we love. <clears throat> Legalism actually precludes maturity. Precludes is just a fancy word that means prevents. If you're trying to keep... Uh, a positive balance in some sort of moral checking account, and that's how you're operating your faith, you will overdraw it. I can promise that. 
because the righteousness of Christ now stands in our place. Can we agree together to honor that as mature Christian adults and to not let our pursuit of the edge keep us from growing? Lord Jesus, I want to pray for this church. I pray that all of us would make our moms happy. By not striving to see how far we can go before we get in trouble, but instead by striving to bring joy and pleasure to the people that we love, Lord, first and foremost, you. God, I confess that in my life I have gotten dangerously close to some edges that I never wanted to see. And I pray for anyone who is feeling a hot flash or is feeling their blood pressure go up as I mentioned some of these things, Lord, I pray that that would be a sign to them that they need to seek some help. That's why your church is here. That's why we are here. The worst thing we can do in response to people slandering us is to try and uh, cope with it by being as close as we were before we met you, God, today. We don't want to be anything like what we were before we met you, Lord. We want to be made new as you say that you're going to do. So I pray that we would all have the courage and the strength to respond to your gospel with maturity. In the name we pray. Amen.